Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is Alex Kapitanakis. He is the CEO of Atlas Vaults, a Panama City-based wealth and gold storage company. Alex, welcome. Nice to be with you. Absolutely. Where, Alex, are you calling in from today? Well, I'm call- right now I'm calling out of Miami, but uh, most of the time I'm in Panama, in, in the Republic of Panama, where we have the vault. But uh, I travel back and forth, and uh, sometimes I'm in Europe as well. That's awesome. So I, I think this is going to be a really interesting episode. People have had tons of questions about storing gold, storing precious metals and bullion, uh, and then even going to the direction of storing uh, crypto and cold storage and all that. So we're going to get into a variety of topics around uh, around everything to do with, with storing uh, physical assets and Atlas Vault. So I thought maybe, Alex, the best way to get started would be to just give us an overview of Atlas Vaults as a company. Atlas Vault is a company that I started uh, primarily because of the need that I had, which is to store to store uh, gold and silver in a safe and completely independent uh, location. And I had, had, had originally wanted to create something that would be small and just uh, for personal and in small amounts of different clients. And as I started in the project, I realized it had to be a lot more uh, elaborate. And I created, uh, I had to, I created a, essentially what was going to be and what is a, a Swiss style vault with uh, six levels of security that essentially once <laughs> you get in, you can't get out. It's unless you, you've got the special clearances. So that's, that's what I created, and that's what that's what we are, and uh, it's essentially to a safe place. It's not connected to any bank or any banking system. There are no third party risks. You are you when you are when you become part of Atlas. It's yours. You control it. You're the only one who can access it. Nobody at Atlas can access it. It's yours, and you decide when you want to move it, what you want to do with it. It's it's a it's a place for people to privately have control of their hard earned wealth. I like it. How did the personal need arise for you? I I travel a lot to Panama and other places in South America, and I as a U.S. Uh, U.S. citizen, I I wasn't happy with with what has been going on with the U.S. banking system. And I wanted to a place uh, that was independent of the U.S. banking system. And as I went to Panama and I discovered, well, Panama's not that independent of the U.S. banking system. It, it, it's too connected. And I started to believe and, and desire to create, to get involved in something that I can control that didn't have debt like uh, the dollar is, which is debt-based. So I started getting into gold and silver. And then I decided, well, I need I need a place that I could trust to store it. And that is how the idea was created because the places that I saw in Panama were not to my liking and I, I wanted to sleep well at night. So I ended up creating something that was a lot more than I originally had planned, but was necessary. And I now, I now, I think I have probably the largest vault in uh, in most of South America, and it's definitely I would I bride to say it's definitely the most secure. And the the largest vault? Yeah, we have over we have over two thousand. We have two thousand uh, actual uh, independent storage units for 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 indiv- individual and independent clients. Okay. Yeah, it must have been a huge capital investment. Like where did you even source the you know the vault doors and all that well, stuff? Well, that's all that's all part of uh we we had to get once we got into the the building of it, we had to use uh uh we we went through uh, Hamilton Safe and uh Brinks and we made sure that we were up to their standards. And so that's that's what we did. We also created a 
a separate and secure entrance because one of the things that really bothered me as a as a customer as a client was that uh, you want security you want safety and most of the vaults that i would see you would come out uh in a parking lot full of uh you know dozens of people and people the street and i wanted to create an ind- a place where you can go in and park securely and not be seen and and not be subject to let's say people that want to rob you that are watching you Mm-hmm. Uh, so mm-hmm. that was very important. And so that's one, that's one of the factors that we have at Atlas, a secure independent entrance. And, uh, we have six stages of, of security. That means that you got to pass through six different levels before you can get to your actual vault. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely come back to even more of the mechanics, but I guess before we get too far in the episode, Alex, I'd love to just hear a bit more about yourself and your backstory because I'm just guessing you have an interesting story. I guess I'm assuming you're of Greek origin. You were born in Cuba, grew up in Miami. Now you're doing stuff in Panama. So you have a very international background. We'd love to just hear a little bit more about I'm you. A, I, I'm actually a Cuban Greek, a uh, U.S. citizen, and I... I was, uh, I still am a practicing attorney and I, I don't, I don't go to court anymore, but I, I, that's how I, that's how I earned my living originally. And then I started investing in different, uh, businesses. And what I ended up doing was, uh, uh, I did, I liked the opportunities that existed in Panama and I wanted to establish a business in South America. And to me, Panama is an incredible, uh, it's, it's a, it's a port area. It's a it's a it's a, a port of of opportunity to go to all the other places in South America, and we're two and a half hours away from Miami. I go to Miami and back and forth all the time, and mm-hmm. uh, we're not very far from Texas and from California, so it's it's a very it's in a convenient location, and most people don't realize that uh, a lot of a majority of people can speak uh, English in Panama. Although we, I, I mean, I'm fluent in Spanish, but a, a majority of uh, of the people in in the business world, at least, are very fluent in in, in English. So it it, op- it offered an opportunity, and I I was excited to create that. And I, I in a, in a couple of other businesses, uh, I I have a you know I I try and I've I've also got a little bit a little bit of a farm business that deals with. Uh, olive oil and and that's that's the greek side but that's that's the that's a story in a nutshell yeah very cool what what is the story of greek people moving to cuba cuba's all cuba was always fascinating to to the greeks i mean uh, my father was a was a sailor and uh, at the time uh, in the 50s cuba was the most exciting place that uh, anybody in europe had, had discovered so there was uh, it was a it was a, a rambling uh, place of nightclubs and it, it was business opportunities. My father had a a business that dealt with the ships, and it was something mm-hmm. that uh, I mean it's a country he fell in love with. And obviously, when the communists took over, uh, things changed, and the world pretty much was was destroyed from that uh, from that point of view and. We went to, we, we resettled in Florida. Okay. Okay. I'm like thinking of like the Onassis family and like, yeah, well, I wish <laughs> like Greek, Greek shipping families. Onassis actually made his fortune in, in Argentina. You may know that. Uh, and, and he, it was dealing with ships, but it was re- really dealing with, uh, merchandise. He was, uh, he started with, uh, tobacco and other other cargo on ships, and it, and he found his fortune in Argentina. Interesting. Yeah, I guess I'm sure everyone kind of knew each other back then, back in the, like all the shipping magnate families and stuff. Well, they might have known each other, but they didn't cooperate much. But uh, that's that's just business. Interesting. Good to know. So you're born in Cuba, grew up in Miami. How did Panama sort of become part of the picture? Um, in, in, uh, like as a business opportunity, was it just a pragmatic thing? You wanted a plan B outside yes. of the United States yeah. or 
How, how did it go? Uh, I wanted to do something in, in business that didn't have the, that honestly, the thing that bothers me the most about the U.S., and I'm an attorney, is that uh, the U.S. has become a, such a litigious uh, country that uh, you can end up losing everything you work for overnight because of the crazy system and the fact that it encourages lawsuits by some of the lowest forms of lawyers that I've ever seen. Uh, but that that's the U.S. system. It's out of control. You go to places like South America and nobody thinks about how you can get rich quick in, in a lawsuit, but that's what's happened in the United States. And and even though I am an attorney, I, you know, I just don't, I, I, I can't agree and live in a system that, per, that allows for that kind of environment. And it's not the environment that's conducive to a free business and, and actually freedom in general. Mm-hmm. And so you mentioned that one of the themes that would excite you to talk about on the episode was the opportunities that exist in escaping the United States to relatively more free places. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, there are so many opportunities now in Panama, Colombia, Mexico. I used to laugh when I saw you know the, the stories on the news about people uh, who didn't like their government in the United States saying, I'm going to run off to Canada. I'm going to, I'm moving to Canada. And I always used to wonder, you know, why do they always say Canada when, and instead of Mexico and, and so, Southern places beyond Mexico, when it's the, the life is so much better. The expenses are so much less. The opportunities, uh, the, yes, there are, there are, uh, issues with crime in some places, not in Panama, but in Mexico. But but a lot of that is exaggerated. I mean, whenever I hear people say, well, you know, you can get killed in Mexico, I said, have you walked through Miami lately? I mean, what, you know, <laughs> why why do you always have these kinds of issues? And I Americans have a very limited view of what is in South America. I find, I find every time people talk to me about Panama and they've never seen Panama, they think there are chickens walking around the streets. And if you go to Panama and you see Panama City, not to be confused with Panama City, Florida, if you go to Panama, it looks like it, it, most people that see it say they think they're in Miami. It looks like the same place. Mm-hmm. As, as a matter of fact, it's cleaner than, than Miami, and it's, uh, it's a lot easier to move around, except for the traffic. But even Miami, Miami's got terrible traffic as well. But the traffic is the worst mm-hmm. part of being in Panama. How long have you been going to Panama? Uh, now going on 10, 12 years. So you must have seen a lot of changes. Panama has been expanding. It is, you know, it is like the capital of South America in many ways. A, a, lot, of, a lot of businesses and a lot of companies find that Panama's uh, is geographically and politically in a very, very good place. Of course, you've got the Panama Canal, and you have issues like, uh, you know, you don't have the same danger of constant political upheaval as you do in other places because the United States uh, does not allow Panama to have a military. The United States has protection. So in a way... You know, I, I say one thing and it conflicts with another. The United States is uh, the big brother of, the, uh, of Panama, so it does have that protection. You have the benefits of being in a semi-United States environment, but at the same time, you are in a freer area because it's under Panamanian law, Panamanian control, and you have the South American mentality, which is a lot easier and a lot easier to deal with in a in a daily basis when I talk, when I'm in referring to business. Yeah. You find that to be the case that it's potentially easier to do business in Panama than in the United if States. If you do your homework and you get the right people, because like, it, unlike in the United States, you, you can, if you don't get the right people involved in what you're doing, you'll end up with a lot of headaches because you don't know the territory. 
But yeah, Panama mm-hmm. in general, I think it's easier because uh, you, it's not as easy. Look, the United States, it's very easy to open a bank account. It takes you two hours. In Panama, it could take you three days, four days. And they deal, but that's not because of Panama. That's because of the United States. The regulations and the and gotcha. the implications the, the the implications of its rules are so strong. But that happens in that happens in Europe and in most of South America. Every bank has to deal with an American legal system or banking system. So yes, there are co- complications. But when you get the right people, the right attorneys, the right uh, accountants. Uh, life is uh, much easier if you did it right to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I guess that you don't know this about me. Uh, I am an anonymous account, but I do have a base in Panama. Um, I may or may not have bank accounts in Panama. So I do know the the system well, to some extent, just uh, as FYI. Then you know how, (laughs) you know how hard it can be. The banking system is a problem. Um, I, but I, you know, I find that uh, the banking system has become a problem all around the world. So I, I mm-hmm. believe to the, to the greatest extent we can, I'd like to be independent of the banking system. And that's been my goal, which is not easy and it's not, it's not always uh, practical or feasible, but to the greatest extent that I can, I like to have an involvement outside of the banking system and not have to use it. And I'm referring to legally get out of the banking system and using alternatives to the banking system in, in exchange for exchange of value. So that's, that's the goal of Atlas. And that's the, and that's the goal of uh, the people that find me that they want, they want privacy and freedom and they want to stay on the right side of the law, and they're trying to find that balance. Yeah, we just had a tweet uh, yesterday, uh, which was well timed, uh, where we were talking about how some of the only things that you do not need to report to the IRS are internationally held real estate and internationally held um, safety deposit boxes, physical assets, gold. Precious metals. That, that right? is true. So, do do you want to elaborate that uh, on that a little bit? Uh, you just said it. I mean, I, I try not to get into. Uh, obviously, the tax tax advice is very, very independent and individual. You have to be very careful with that. Uh, but it is true mm-hmm. that uh, until they change it, the IRS does not require you to report the uh, real estate and. Uh, gold, gold and silver, and safety deposit boxes that are not part of the banking system. That's that's the actual uh, regulation. I, I believe that's still the case. Uh, now that that you know they could change that with the government anytime they want in the U.S., but that is the case. And you do have to report your profits uh, every time you sell your gold and silver. But that's based on a different kind of. Uh, that, that's not an ink. That's not a classic. Uh, that's that would be right. considered. You're a not different reporting kind of assets, income. but you might have to report the, the capital yes. gains. Or, and exactly. Like that. Um, so when you say um, you want to diversify away from the banking system, what do you mean by that? Well, the what I mean by that is you get away from the savings accounts, get away from keeping your value your wealth in a savings account or in third party liability controlled uh, assets like stocks, bonds. I'm not going to go against people that love stocks and bonds. That's that's their business and and obviously everybody has their own idea, but I and and you should have a percentage of something uh, in in any case because things change. But I believe that your savings should be in your hands. Uh, I have, mm-hmm. I have been the victim of a banking failure on, on in two different countries, and I will tell you that uh, once the bank fails, you're screwed. You don't have anything there. Uh, you have whatever you thought you owned. You didn't own. The bank owns it, and so I believe in have something that you control, 
that you know is in your hands and nobody else's. And that's why I that's why Atlas exists. Because essentially you go into Atlas and only one person can open up your box. That's you. No one else. I can't do it. And if I wanted to do it, I would have to go through a major process and it's essentially like an eviction. And I have to then, before I could ever just break the box, I don't have a key to your box. I have a key that opens your box with your key. It takes two keys to open up your specific property. My key will not open your box. And that, that, is, the, that is the way the safety deposit uh, system works. And that's how we work. And so that it's important. The second part of what I wanted to do is, once you have your savings stored in, in the form of wealth, of gold, silver, whatever other precious items you have, I wanted a, the ability to convert that and use it and convert it into, into, the, uh, into any kind of currency that you, could, you, could then, you can then trade with, you can then pay your bills with, just like you would do with a bank. So it was very difficult to find a system that would be able to take your gold and your silver and convert it so that you can spend it. And I found uh, the ability to partner with a very with a new a company that's quite large. It's worldwide, and it's called Kinesis. And Kinesis allowed me to, uh, as part of their vaulting system, uh, take take my clients, my own my own gold and silver, and deposit it into their account. Create create a, an account with them, and convert, let's say, an ounce an ounce of gold into the equivalent of Kinesis gold, one-to-one, and it's stored in the vault, audited four times a year, and that then allows me to spend it anywhere in the world because it converts the value of that gold has now become a Kinesis Kinesis money, which is exchangeable for dollars or for Bitcoin, or for, I think, two or three other uh, digital currencies. And h- how do you spell Kinesis? K-I-N-E-S-I-S, Kinesis. Uh, and Kinesis what? Like, is there a full yeah, name? Yeah, Kinesis so Money. If I want to Google it. If you, if you enter the name Kinesis, uh, you'll get, as a matter of fact, they're even on. Uh, Free Gold Depository. Um, okay. So that's, that's a bit more of a complicated of a theme. And I do, I a hundred percent want to come back to this stuff because I want to talk about, um, on and off ramps and, um, sort of, uh, the crypto aspect of things. But for the moment, as we're sort of building our podcast episode mm-hmm. here, let's just take the very base case of, uh, like traditional vaults and gold storage, um, remind me, how, how long you guys been in business for? Since uh, it's going on four and a half years now. Four and a half years. Um, I, I read something where you guys said that you can compare with the best of the Swiss vaults. You're the Swiss vault of Latin America. What makes it so much more secure than maybe your competitors? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I have that many competitors, but uh, uh, look, I, I, I only want to I'll, I'll speak to what we have. Uh, okay. you'll have to go and analyze and, and study the competitors. But I know that what we have is uh, we are, th- the actual vault itself has uh, has uh, steel, steel reinforced and concrete reinforced by uh, uh, all around it by about uh, two feet. Uh, the, it's the, the, the bottom of the, the, the whole area is so, is, is completely, structured so that uh i think it could even withstand a few a few attacks with a with with uh bombs so it's okay i believe it, you. it's I believe. <laughs> it you have to go through six different sections that that kind of keep you stuck it feels like uh feels like you, if you've got claustrophobia it, it's a problem and you know i say that because i have claustrophobia so i i it, it's hard for me to get in and out of the little sections but uh you you it it uses uh, fingerprint and facial recognition to get through the 
different stages. And uh, mm-hmm. it's it's meant to, uh, it's, it's a lot more secure than what I've seen in the area. Additionally, it's in the heart of downtown Panama, the banking area. It's also mm-hmm. very private when you come in, which means you are, if you're coming in with some, let's say you, if you have a, uh, a, a, some gold you want to take out or put in, nobody sees you coming out of your car or going in or, go, or going going into your car, uh, except for the people in a very pri- in a in a secure private parking lot that's under the ground. You know, it's under. Okay, so it's like you drive into yes. a garage first, yes. and then like go up an elevator, and then and it has it has a private entrance that uh, no one can expect. Nobody can can be outside waiting for you. It's it's a way to to keep yourself private so that because I some of the places that I saw in Panama and I was a customer of one of those places, uh, I had to I had to go in and out of these places uh, with you know in in the middle of the day with uh, just hundreds of people walking around and whoever wanted to just spot you and study you and and go hunting could could do it. And it's not very safe. Mm-hmm. And so I, I wanted a place where you feel completely secure and nobody can nobody can be stalking you and waiting so that they uh, mm-hmm. so they can they can get a, a a lucky day by robbing you. you. You know what's funny, Alex, is last time I was in Panama, I was walking around the, the financial center there um, getting some things done. And I literally walked by your building and i saw the sign and it said international vault and safe deposit boxes and i remember thinking like this is dope like panama is cool like this is they got all these services going on and because i have it open on um just on my phone on google maps doing the street view and i'm like this is like literally this is the one i walked by you guys before i've walked by yeah we're right across the street from uh i believe the hotel is the the executive uh we're you're, we're diagonally across the street from them. Uh, we're very close to everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, traffic is always a problem. I'm not going to tell you it isn't, but you live you've been in Panama. You know it's it'll drive you crazy. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, we have. You know, we, I I don't there are, there is another place that's uh, if, if you know what Panama is like, and uh, you know that the Panama Canal is the biggest area. It's the the exist the reason for the existence of the country. But if you cross to get to the other side of the Panama Canal, uh, is an incredible uh, feat. It's an incredible. Uh, it, it's a very difficult thing to do during like most of the day, especially during the rush hour, because it's one very big mm-hmm. bridge with just two lanes to get in and uh, across, and. As far as I know, one of my competitors is on the other side of that. And I will tell you one thing. It takes a lot for me to want to go and cross that bridge because it'll, it's like three <laughs> hours of traffic. Right, right. You got uh, Arehan and all that. Yeah, you don't want to go over there. Um, okay, I got it. And so uh, just to help uh, for people visualize it, what are the actual – services that you offer you have safety deposit boxes of different sizes just run us through the the offerings real quick we have uh depending on what you want like you we have the uh a few small boxes that we can they're great to keep your uh like your your digit your crypto keys in and things like that uh and and your documents and the bigger boxes the medium sized boxes and the bigger boxes are basically to keep whatever gold and silver you have and that stores and that that's, we charge it by the year and it's actually, I mean, it's, it's a year long rental and it's, uh, and I, I think we're, you know, I can't tell you the exact price cause it's changed right now, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not very expensive for, uh, to keep, to keep something as how much more or less for like the mini box, the document box. And then like, I don't know, like, uh, like a Nike shoebox, a Nike one. shoebox. Uh, I are are like a, a medium or small box is about six hundred fifty a year, and uh, the bigger boxes are uh, uh, twelve twelve hundred a year. So 
So it's it's a very good it's a very good bargain because you're paying it once a year and you know some of the vaults that I met I met a couple of the really big vaults in the United States that have come to see me. One in particular, he came to see me and he has uh places in Miami and uh all over the world. And the first thing he said after he after he uh, looked at everything, I gave him the full tour. Uh, he looked at me and he says, well, you, you don't charge every time they come in? And I said, what are you talking about? He says, oh, we charge our clients every time they come in. And I said, "Visiting fee. <laughs> they charge a fee every time they come and visit. And I said, no, we don't do that. And he was kind of shocked. But, um, you know, that's that's the way it goes. They're, you know, that, that was a Swiss vault, by the way. They they actually have vaults in, in Switzerland and all over the, all over the U.S., I mean, what are people even visiting for? They're just like checking in on stuff. <laughs> I guess they're grabbing documents and well, adding stuff, taking away the stuff. The people that use us are people that are like you, maybe someone like you would be uh, or your sa- whatever. If you have your savings, uh, you buy your gold and silver, which we also help you with. Our, you know, We have a service that, uh, that will give you uh, all the contacts you need. We, we, are, we do sell gold and silver through a separate company that we, we have. And, uh, and they have, you know, people that come in, they, they look to, they look for the privacy to keep their stuff safe. You know, they, their, their private document. Yeah. How often, how, how often do you think the average person visits their safety deposit? Boxes? I have like less than one clients that come in every, every, uh, two times a month. Uh, if they, if they're from the U S they'll come in when they, when they, when they come to the, uh, to visit, they'll come in for a couple of hours. Um, I, I mean, we have, we have people that are in Europe that come to see that, that are clients. So they'll come two times, uh, two times a month or one time a month. And it's basically, it, it, it. it, there is no right. There is no, there's no pattern, but some people don't ever come. Some people, you know, they'll, they, they forget it. And then you know, once they rent it, they forget it. Other people come in every, every other day. It depends on the person. <laughs> All right. All right. I got you. Um, okay. I've, I do have a, a related question and we'll get to the buying gold stuff in a second, but I wanted to know like what percentage of the clients are Panamanian citizens? What percentage are Panama residents, right? Like they have a second residence permit. And then what percentage are just basically on a tourist visa and are like full out foreigners? Let's I'd say. say, I'd say about 40% are, I, and I'm, I'm taking a guess here, but about 40% are South American and 20% are non-Panamanian residents. They're, they, 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 the majority of the people that are, that are using our services are from, are from other countries. And, uh, but most of the people that come to use our services have have gone through uh they they get a, they they go through the lawyers of the legal system and they create they create their own uh, legal residency and they uh, they're there because they're creating a a separate uh, al- alternative life there so most of the people that come have uh, uh other had uh, uh homes in other co- countries and probably still do but have established a residency in Panama Okay, so you'd say most people are residents. Yeah, but it, you don't have to be. I mean, you can as long as you pass, you know, the uh, know your client uh, basic questions that we have and the documentation. Uh, you don't have to be a resident to open up an, an account with us and and keep a box. Uh, essentially, you just have to you just have to not be involved in in criminal activity, and you have to you know, show that you are. Uh, a person that has abided by the law. Yeah. Could you speak to the KYC process a little bit more? Cause we definitely had people ask about that on Twitter. We take your, uh, when you, when you sign up for us, we, we do, a, a, a we do a check on your, make sure you don't have a criminal background that, uh, there's no international warrants or anything like that. We do take your, we, we take a copy of your passport and your driver's license, 
And uh, we, we do have to establish that the, your source of income has not been derived from illegal activity. Uh, but it's not, I mean, we're not part of the banking system, so we don't have to follow all those uh, same regulations. But believe it or not, we, I think we're, we're probably tougher than the, than the banking system. But we just want to make sure that everything is, is being legally uh, followed and that people are safe because mm-hmm. we once you're part of our system we want to make sure we protect the system and the integrity of the system so we are careful with that and to get in just to get into our vault you have to present your 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 uh, passport to get in and show your identity your and 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 our staff will check you out before you're allowed to get into the office area wow so you actually need the passport, not even the driver's license to, to get into well, your the driver's license to get into the first level. I think we do. We have we have allowed that. Yes. Well, to, to okay. open up an account, you need your passport. OK, um, another question that came from Twitter. Can these um, can can the safety deposit box be opened via a Panama company, i.e. a Panama trust or yes. foundation? or just like in the name of an entity, or does it have to be an individual? No, it can be both. Uh, as a matter of fact, you, and you can, you can allow for, uh, you can allow for, uh, I believe three people to have access to your vault, uh, your vault account that you have to, uh, you have to establish them through our same process and they have to have their fingerprints and everything taken. Cause that's what part of the process, but, you can be you can designate uh, people in your account that you give per you give access to. And by the way, when you do that, that's your that's your business and your danger because uh, sometimes you know one like a father will give full access to a son, and the son comes in and takes everything out, and that's his business. If you gave that person access, you did it. Yeah, no, and. I get it. Um, and so could, could it be like a U.S. company or Panama company and then you give the lawyer or the power Absolutely. of attorney access? Absolutely. It's all has, yeah. It all has to be done through uh, a legal process and uh, lawyers that provide the documentation that we then have on file and we follow. But yes, we have, as a matter of fact, we have a lot of, a lot of power of attorney uh, situations where people, you know, there some people are getting on in years and they give uh, representatives of their power of attorney, and these people have access to to that that wealth, and we just we follow the instructions of the client to the letter. And Got you it. can't have you um, can have uh, companies, Panamanian companies, and uh, in Panama, there's a thing called the foundation, which I'm you might be familiar with. That that is like a trust. And that that is established uh, under Panama law, and people can have uh, their property under the foundation, and uh, they they can open up a, an account through that. Okay. Does it have to be a Panamanian entity, or could it be like a I don't know, like a Cayman entity or American entity? Stuff no, like it's, that? Uh, any any entity that has a, a legal status can open up the account that you then, we then would recommend that you have a Panama lawyer review your documentation to make sure it's going to be, uh, it's going to be valid and, and it will have the force of law in, in Panama, but you can do it. You just have to be careful and make sure that it's done through the, through the proper legal experts that you should hire. Got it. Um, a couple of people asked, can the government seize those vaults and in what cases? I, like, could a foreign government put a subpoena type thing on it or, or the Panamanian government? Yeah, I guess. Could you speak to that a bit? The, the situation with a, if you think about the vault itself, it's, it's the same as having uh, an apartment building. And each vault box is an individual apartment. If somebody were in some kind of uh, legal problems with the government, that government would then have, under a process of law, 
would then have to pr- produce a, a subpoena that would specifically uh, requ- uh, request the uh, property of that specific box and that specific uh, issue, and it would only be that per- that box that could get in, and we are very strict on that. So uh, if somebody has some kind of probable cause to, with a subpoena to come in, it has to be specific, and uh, it has to be specifically mentioning what it's looking for. And if not, we're prepared to challenge it every time it happens. But no, the government can't just come in and seize everything. Got it. I, I actually like that analogy with uh, the apartment building, apartment unit, uh, with what you guys do. Well, it, it actually, that's exactly what it is. I mean, we when you sign a, we have a very long contract. And when you sign the contract, we tell you what you what you are going to use the box for, as long as it's all legal, we do not have the right to know what's in it unless you're telling us you're going to do this, unless you're going to, you, you disclose that. Uh, when you take out your box, my staff doesn't look at you doing that. We have, we have two special rooms that you take your box and you, and you take it in and you lock yourself in and you open that box and you, whatever you're doing with that, that's your business. We do not, my staff, even if you open there, you'll find it a little funny, but if you're in the vault itself and you open the box, my staff, they turn their back on you so that they, they don't even want to see you doing it. Now we know that. Is, is there like a camera in the vault? There's no camera in the vault. We have cameras everywhere else and there are no cameras in the, in the actual rooms where you go in to, to look in, uh, at your, you know, at your property. It's kind of like using the bathroom. No cameras in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like the same thing, right? It's like the only place there's yeah, no, no we have we have we have cameras uh at all the major points of entrance and uh at the staff, but we don't have cameras in the vault and we don't have cameras in the in the, the two rooms. We do yeah, have a it. we have a conference room that we offer to our clients where we can they we allow our clients to call meetings and uh they can you know they're they're free to bring in their the people that they want to to meet and uh, sometimes we have people that are like coin collectors and they'll bring in their special coins and they'll have little little conferences there and it, it's a you know we we try to be very accommodating and we also have uh like a concierge service where people fly in from a different part of the world and they they don't know what they should be doing with uh attorneys or with with uh, accountants and we're, we we give them the names of people and and we try to help them. We try to be as uh, as much of a of a family connection as anything that they they would have if, if they did have relatives in Panama. Got it. Yeah, we'll get into some of those ancillary services soon. I, I like that. A um, couple more questions about sort of like government jurisdiction type stuff. Um, what are some of the advantages of using a Panama based uh, vault over other countries' vaults, such as Cayman, Bahamas, Switzerland, Vanuatu, etc. Well, I used to think Switzerland was the most incredible place to have your wealth, until I realized what Switzerland has become. And if you want to have your wealth in a country that will, that first of all, they don't want you if you're an American. They will. They won't even give you a bank account now in Switzerland. But uh, Switzerland has become very, very intrusive. And uh, they do not care about your individual privacy anymore. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I guess people don't have a problem with that, but I do. Uh, places like uh, some of the islands, I, I looked at some of those places, and I, you know, I find, you know, there some of them are some of them are not bad alternatives, but. Uh, one, you know, something like you, I said, I believe you mentioned uh, Vanuatu. That is extreme. Well, it, it's, it's Pretty very remote. remote and I'm not sure how, you know, you know, how stable it is, but it, I, I like the idea, but it's, it's very far. Uh, it, I mean, for me being, getting on a plane in two and a half hours from Miami is, is you know, it's, it's a lot easier than going to New York city. Right. Right. Or theoretically, you know, you could drive down from New York City. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, uh, you know, th- it's not that hard. Uh, but and I and like I said, in terms of in terms of stability. 
and and do your homework on that. But in terms of stability, Panama, I think, is a very, very stable uh, and very, you know, very positive country for. And I don't, you know, a lot of the government stuff, especially after the pandemic, it, it, it really bothered me. But, you know, so did so did uh, California. And I'll say one thing, it's freer in Panama than it is in California. This is true. What what are the most popular jurisdictions? Did I, I I'm not even certain I named them correctly. Like other than Panama, I, where, I think you mentioned are, are the Cayman out? Islands is very is very popular. Uh, wow. Malta is very popular. Mm. Uh, and it all depends on your your choice. And I, I will say the the legal the legal uh, hurdles in some of those places just to start a company are incredibly difficult. Uh, in, in, in Panama, it's not so hard. It's very easy. It's very easy to start and create a company. The, the, uh, it's almost as easy as it is in the United States. As a matter of fact, I'd say it's almost equal. If you want to start your own company and, and create, the only, the only drawback to starting a company in, in, in Panama is it's hard to get a bank account. And it's even harder if you're an American. I, yeah, I, I remember... Yeah, I was. I remember was surprised that like just to open a bank account, um, the lawyers wanted to charge like a eight hundred dollar fee or something just to open it. In in Panama, you mean? Well, yeah. it, I I think that's probably excessive. Uh, uh, you need to you need to kind of shop around a little bit about that, and you really don't need to have the the lawyer. The lawyer basically could call and and have and have people that they know in the bank start you off, but it shouldn't be that much of a process. I will tell you in other countries, uh, it, it's probably a lot more. In, in places like the islands you mentioned, uh, you're gonna That's spend $5,000 to create a, a bank account and a, and a company. You know, something like the Cayman mm-hmm. Islands, they're making a fortune out of charging people that kind of money. And I, and I, don't, see the, I don't see the benefit to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, related. It, it makes me think of a question that particularly happens with islands, but I guess for everyone, which is how you even get the valuables into and out of the jurisdiction. Because don't you often have to report if you have like more than ten thousand dollars worth of valuables and stuff? I know that you know that's not your responsibility. Well, um, and you know people can store whatever they want, but I we do help you. You must know a little. We bit help about you that. because I, I actually have on my staff a contract with uh, an expert in customs, uh, so we do everything legally. And and I have had this woman now giving me advice. She is a professor, and she used to work for the Panama Customs. And when I have a question, I and my cut my customers, my clients have have issues. We present it to her and we take care of it before it gets involved in the, in the actual physical movement. So one of the things that most people aren't aware of is there are treaties between Panama and other countries. And those treaties have allowed major benefits. And the only uh, one of those major benefits is, for example, if you have uh, American gold, if you have gold in the United States that you bought in the United States and originated in the United States and you want to send it to Panama, it's tax free. You do not have to pay a tax on it. Now, normally you do have to pay a tax anytime you bring in gold from a non-treaty country. But if you come if it comes from let's see, I, I will if it specifically from the United States, from Switzerland. And from Singapore, off the top of my head, that's three. There are specifically treaty countries with Panama that have exempted the tax charge on on such gold and silver. Mm -hmm. But you have to do it correctly, and you have to have the paperwork to show that it came through, and it becomes it it becomes a major savings, and you're only then your only expense is the cost of having to ship it, which can be expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me think like, where could the Panama Canal or the Cologne free zone come into play here? Is there an advantage 
to having um, those uh, uh, those sort of assets available? Not really, because if I could easily turn Atlas into a free zone if I wanted to, but it doesn't give you anything other than keeping it there. The minute you take something out of a free zone, you get taxed. So, mm. you know, once, once you take, you can have, you can have it come in, but if you, if you came, if it came in through a non-tax treaty country, then you don't have to worry about the free zone issue. You just, it's in there, it's in your property, it's your property and you have no more headaches. That's, that's the first problem. Uh, Really, the, the, the expense that you need to worry about is uh, as, as long as you're coming in from a different country is, is, your, is the cost of shipping, shipping and, and, and transfer insurance. And are, are things being shipped by plane typically or through the canal and like a No, no, no. That's, it's all by plane uh, unless it's a huge amount. But uh, even then, I think it should be by plane. Uh, yeah, that's if you're going to spend millions on gold, uh, you you don't want to put that on a ship. <laughs> okay, good to know. Interesting. So the Cologne Free Trade Zone has, uh, and we had an episode actually, one of our early episodes. You guys can look it up. One of my buddies has like a scooter company, and they make electric scooters, and he ships the parts in from China to the Cologne Free Trade Zone, and then they like assemble it there, and then it goes on to California. Um, it's kind of a complicated space or like the regulations around the the cologne free trade zone but that that often sounds like that's not really a piece of the puzzle not really here. because I, I can see what he's doing in that case because you're you're creating you're assembling it in 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 panama so you probably have other other tax benefits to consider uh in the case of gold and silver if you take gold and silver and you put it into a, a free zone, as soon as you take it out of that free zone, the government is going to ask you to pay a tax. It's as if you brought it in from the airport. It's the same thing. But if you if that qualified, if that gold and silver came from those treaty exempted countries, you never have that problem. You just bring it in and then you put it into your box, into your into the vault. Got it. So the U.S. has a treaty. Yes. The U.S. has a treaty, and uh, Switzerland has a treaty, and I believe Dubai. Ooh. What about Canada? What about European I, Union? You know what? I, I can tell you, well, the European Union, I don't believe uh, as a union, as the union itself. Uh, I'm not sure about Germany, but I do know that, uh, I do know that it, Switzerland is, one of, is the country that uh, specifically we have the exemption. And Switzerland does manufacture gold and silver, as you know. So it's a it's it's very convenient and very very useful for our clients. Got it. And so I guess what that means is that people should buy their gold if they're not going to buy it in Panama. They should buy it in a country that has a treaty with. Yeah. Panama. If you come to our, our our office and you say I want to buy some gold, we would immediately buy it from those countries. Uh, and and we would have it we would have it sent uh, either by Brinks or any other or, or other other sources and and have it delivered to the vault and we would take delivery and then we would have it uh, we would have you place it in your in your private vault and and take complete control of it. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, because I guess you could probably buy it locally in Panama, but there's probably some things. That you're gonna need to source it's, from abroad, like maybe it's like rare coins or yeah. rare. You it's know, very yeah. for it, it. Buying gold and silver in Panama is uh, is a very difficult thing today. It's very really? legal, Don't but tell us about the that. banking system doesn't allow businesses to sell and trade in gold and silver. They'll close you down. I don't know why, but that's what they do now. How we deal with that is uh, we have Atlas broker in Peru, and uh, and Peru deals with uh, d deals with all our our purchases. That's our company, and uh, and we make the we have the the banking account there, and that does all the purchasing, and that's and and then we ship the gold uh, wherever you want, either if 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 you if you live in Miami, send send it to Miami or send it to the vault in Panama. It all depends. 
on what you want to do. But I believe that in Panama itself, not because of the legal system, but because of the banking system, they don't like their they don't like buying and selling on 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 normal business trades uh, in the gold and silver market. Interesting. I wasn't aware of that. It's a practical problem that exists. And I'll tell you the reason. It, it, the reason is uh, greed on the part of the bank. If you, be, if you give me $100,000 to buy gold and I send that $100,000 to, to a business account to buy the gold from the producer, I charge, you, I charge you a fee for that. But the majority of that goes to buy the gold. Banks don't like that. They don't that at least the Panamanian banks don't like that because that money doesn't stay in their account. It goes straight to the gold producer, which and then which then goes to you as a client. Right. It sort of leaves the banking system coming back to how we started. Exactly. The they don't like it. So, you know, I've gone through hell trying to find banks that aren't just ridiculous. And and you know, one one of the things we have, and that's why our our gold and silver buying and 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 selling happens in in Peru, and we're in we're out of uh, Miraflores, Peru, and the vault is in Panama. And now I would rather I would rather be able to do all of it right there in Panama, but Panama, the banking system just doesn't acknowledge uh, on a normal basis. Now maybe maybe if uh, if you have if the banking president is your best friend, they might allow you to do it, but. Normally, it won't happen. Okay, good to know. What what percentage of the clients do you think are bringing in their own gold versus buying gold off you guys? Well, we've had a lot of people that have come from other places in Panama that have decided to move their stuff, uh, and so that in that case, we have had some uh, from other competitors that have moved in. Uh, and I'd say that percentage was about 40, 50%. And the others have been bringing it in or buying it directly. It's hard to tell how much because especially after the pandemic, a lot of things stopped. So, Okay, interesting. Uh, so I guess just to clarify, like what percentage of clients do you think are um, – uh, are getting some of those ancillary services. You mean the, all the, or that is about 60%. 60% of the people that come to us uh, end up uh, asking us for recommendations as to uh, a, a lawyer, an accountant. And we, you know, we, I try to tell you, if you're going to be doing any kind of, even if you're not doing a normal business, if you're just opening up something like an account, it's always good to have, your own accountant and your own lawyer to give you some advice because you, you know, you're in a different place and you, you need to have someone who's trustworthy and will give you advice that that won't get you in any hot water and it makes sure everything is done right. Okay. What are the options that people have for buying gold? Is it a wire? Can they buy through crypto? Can they buy with cash? Okay. Most of the time, uh, most of the time they, they can buy, in small amounts, they can buy in cash. Uh, majority of the people, and we prefer that it will be by wire, and the wire is then transferred to our to the accounts that we have in in, in Peru, and that account then purchases the gold directly from our from our uh, manufacturers, and that and then that that gold is then is then shipped to the client in Panama, and we take we take possession for the client. And once that's there, the client can come in and open up the box and everything is started. It, while it's waiting for the client, we have a, our own uh, private banking uh, box that we keep and we keep uh, client stuff there in our own, in our own uh, box for the client specifically until that client is able to get there and open up the box or have somebody with the power of attorney to open up their own box. In addition to that, uh, sometimes they will buy. One of the things we do offer is, is clients will want to sell or buy within our own uh, community of, of clients. And we act as a, mm -hmm. as a mediator for the clients. And 
and uh, and and just introduce them and to and let the people know that uh, client A wants to sell some coins. Uh, some somebody in our own uh, within our own client base will want to buy the coins, and that's between the two clients. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Obviously, we're not uh, advocating like money laundering or anything. I understand why you have to have uh, safeguards in place, but people ask about this stuff. So I have oh, to yeah, part of life. be the middleman and, 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 and ask uh, the questions on the podcast. So people could buy with a little bit of cash. Uh, can they buy with crypto? Can they buy with Tether, USDC, Bitcoin? To whatever? buy, to buy uh, the only way we have uh, set up right now for that is uh, to, to do it through Kinesis. Because Kinesis mm-hmm. has an exchange where they can exchange for dollars and you can buy with Bitcoin and a couple of other cryptos and they themselves uh, would then handle that exchange. But we right now do not have that, but we would have to put you in touch with that service. Okay, cool. Uh, let's let's talk about uh, Kinesis then. And then also, I'm not sure if this is related, but I saw that you guys were partners with the ABX, that the is Allocated Kinesis. Allocated Boolean That's Exchange. That's Kinesis. A- okay. ABX is a is it's called Allocated Boolean, and they they actually are the the parent company, I believe. I'm not sure if they're the parent, but they are they are definitely associated with Kinesis together, and. Uh, they are they are the i would say they are the the uh the branch that actually handles the metals and we handle we are we are uh agents for them and they uh and kinesis is the digital aspect of it so uh once once uh you can you can actually have purchases done and they can then handle the conversion of that metal and make it make it into a crypto, which is K, called a KAU, and that a Kinesis Kinesis Gold, and that an exchange that could be used on a credit card. It could be used uh, to to transfer as a payment for any kind of debt that you have. So that's that to me. That's one of those uh, services that appealed to me because it handled a, an aspect of the liquidity of gold and silver that I didn't have with the vault by itself. And it gave the security that I was looking for because they have an extremely well-developed system and they are secure. And that's one thing, that's one reason you don't see a lot of that. A one-to-one exchange of gold, one one mm-hmm. ounce of gold to one, you know, well, not one ounce, it's one gram of gold to one, one uh, KAU. And that in itself, that that is something that's very secure, and it's not subject to the. It's not easy to to hack. They spent a fortune on on making uh, on making their uh, their security very tight, and it's something that gives me a little bit of uh, breathing room because I just there's no way I feel comfortable doing that on a on a smaller scale. So that's why we have them yeah. as partners for that. Right, right, right. Are you like? Like a equity holder, board of directors, anything no. like that, or just a, a pure? No, like, we are actually one of their vaults. Uh, we are. We don't. We're we're not owned by them, and we are not. Uh, we don't own any of their stock, but we are together as we. One of the one of the vaults that they have in their system, they have thirteen vaults, and uh, they you, which, it, you can take one of, if you're part of the Kinesis system, you can come into Atlas. And you can deposit into your account with Kinesis at Atlas, or you can take out of Kinesis at Atlas, or you can go to one of their other 12 vaults around the world and do that. Now, they're not, they're not completely set up with us yet. And, but uh, as a matter of fact, I just did a trial run of converting one of my uh, 100 ounce or 100, uh, 100 gram pieces of gold. And I converted it into a Kinesis money for for Atlas just to test it out, and we find we got it started. So we're at the beginning of a very new process. Right, right, right. And partially for that reason, I don't want to dedicate too much of this episode to Kinesis because 
you know, at the end of the day, it's a separate business yes. and, yes. um, and you know, the relationship could go away or change sure. or whatever, but holy crap, like this is like the on and off ramp that people are looking for. I use it myself. I mean, I'm very excited by it because I, I have looked for that. Look to me, the ideal system is to be able to take, let's say your wealth or your, your savings and have it in your hands, but then be able to turn it, turn it and convert it and spend it when you need to spend it. So if I have if I have twenty thousand dollars in gold and I want to I want to buy something with it, I shouldn't have to go crazy trying to convert it. And this is this is a perfect system because it allows me to control my banking, my independence, and and then get if I then I get back into the system because that allows you to get into the system. But this keeps me free to decide I don't need the bank anymore. At some point, I won't need the bank, and no, and neither will you. Of course, the banks aren't going to like that. But at some point, uh, we can have a, an, an economic system that is parallel to their economic system and allows us to do what we want and then convert it back and go back into their system. And that's what this is all about. Got it. And they're based in – it looks like the team's pretty Australian, but maybe they're based in They're Dubai. in Singapore – they're in Hong Kong. Uh, they have a they have a, uh, an office in New York City. They have an office, a main office in London. So they're all over the place, okay. which is why I was interested in it because you know to do something like that you need to be big. You need you need to have the the strength of 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 and unity of of mass income investment, and you have to have strength, and that's why I like it. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Because a lot of people were asking me about on and off ramps. One of the questions, and shout out uh, Jake Nomada, friend of the podcast. You guys can check out the Jake Nomada episode as okay. well. He was also asking about, is it possible to sell gold back to you guys? And if so, how is that paid out? And I guess the answer is Kinesis. It could be done through Kinesis or we would have our we have clients that are put put the word out that they want to buy gold or silver. And we contact the clients independently and say, you know, we have a client who wants to sell. That's, and it, that, like I said, we put it, put the two people together. Uh, it's a community. What I, what I've tried mm -hmm. to develop here is a community of like-minded people. Makes sense. And how do you do that? Like, how do you guys put out those like Tender offers, basically. No, no. Once, is it, once is you have, email, once or? you have, uh, you're a customer. Once you're a client of ours, we have you on our base. And uh, if, if uh, you know, customer client number one has has an offer, we put it out. And then let's say client number two contacts our office, say, hey, you know, I'd I'd like to buy it. We put you two together. Okay, definitely makes sense, huh? Now, if you want to convert that later, yeah, you have Kinesis to convert it and do something else. Or right, you know, one of the things I also like about Kinesis is if you if you mint, if you take your like what I did, I took a hundred grams of gold, Pamp Swiss, and I minted it. I created a hundred grams of KAU. Now, one of the, the the benefit I get of that is not only do I have that in an on and off ramp. But I now get a yield for having minted more Kinesis metal. Oh, so people can have their gold with you guys, stored with you guys. And then they just basically sort of tell Kinesis, hey, I have this gold with Atlas. And then uh, I guess you mint it and then it's in yes. the system. And then they can start earning interest off it's, it's of not interest gold. technically what they they have they pay you and they have a, a lot of very good uh, e uh videos on how it's done but they pay you from their fees worldwide transactional fees they pay you a percent of that so what they what they okay. do is that let's say you get a mentor's yield when you create kinesis and by the way one of the things i like about that Normally, when you use Kinesis, you get a yield for just having Kinesis. It's a small amount, you know, little transactional fees. But if you create 
if you create like my example, I created a hundred Kinesis coins that I will always get a minter's yield off of that. Even if I spend it, I always get the yield because I put a hundred more coins into the system that are based on one-to-one. These aren't like Bitcoins. They're not like everything else. This is a one-to-one. Whatever exists is based on an actual physical amount of gold. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking percentage either, because I wouldn't buy, I wouldn't get into that, and I don't recommend anybody that does any kind of percentage. Fractional ownership, yeah. Run away. Run away from it. This is one-to-one. There is no, there is no game with it. It's 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 just it's an it's basically a symbol of an actual physical amount that exists either in our vault or in one of the other twelve vaults that they have. And uh, at the beginning of the episode, I think you mentioned there were audits every three. No, months. actually, they just came up with a new uh, declaration that they're going to have uh, quarterly audits. Quarterly audits. They used to have audits okay. two times a and- year. And because of all the stuff that's been going on in the in the news, I think they've decided to to show people that uh, you know it's even more secure than than it's ever been, and they want yeah probably want a good call. probably a good call. Hey, you know what? It's <laughs> okay. so easy in the in the financial business to have you know scoundrels that uh, I'm I'm in favor of complete disclosure, and people need to be able to walk in and see whatever is going on daily. Got it. And so what, what does that audit process look like? Does that mean that some sort of third party auditing yes. group is coming into your guys's office? We haven't start, we, we ourselves have not started that yet because they haven't brought in the, the amount of gold yet to start the process. But the way it works is they, they bring in an independent auditor that let's say, let's say that the, for example, they've they've listed uh, five hundred thousand dollars worth of gold is is being stored at Atlas. This is an example, mm-hmm. and that is the amount that it was as of this day it was stored in uh, for Kinesis. The independent auditor will walk in and show the credentials, and we will then open up the the Kinesis uh, box that they have their vault, and they will then count and measure the specific amounts of gold. They will list it, and then they will put their, their stamp uh, and have it witnessed, and that's part of the, that is their, that is their, uh, their actual audit. It, you can see their audits, by the way, on their website. They have copies of the audit you can, you can download. Got it. And does that mean that like a lot of the assets or, or gold in your guys's vaults are actually changing hands no, all the time. No, most of the time, like I said, we haven't even started that yet. I mean, this is something that's right. just, but new. would, would, wouldn't that be the case once it sort of gets, no, because um, financialized? If, it gets, if it's going to change hands, then it will have to be in become the, that particular client will have to open up a Kinesis account through us and that account, they will then have to put their gold into the Kinesis account, which then can ex- exchange hands. So in that case, yes, that in their own account, in the Kinesis account, there's a lot of movement going on. Not yet with us, but that's that's how it's happening. Okay. And then so you'd have to kind of change the register on the, on the box? No. Uh, to represent the new per the new ownership no because the, let's say you have a box with us and then you want to take uh-huh. let you want to take one of your one of your ounces of gold and convert it to a kinesis you you take mm-hmm. one of your ounces and you convert it and by putting it into the kinesis account you then you have now you now have kinesis digital you no longer are Taking, you're not using it. That now you intend for that to be exchanged and transacted, however you want, and that's between you and the Kinesis system, which we are part of. But you're not; it's not part of your normal bank account or your your box account. You've put it into a different a different system. That's the Kinesis okay. system. 
You, you know what would be interesting? I'm just uh, thinking out loud here is if you wanted to move gold around the world from Panama to Singapore, for example, instead of actually moving the gold physically, you could just sort of sell gold in Panama through Kinesis and then buy gold in Singapore, that, something you, like you, that, almost do like a gold trade. That is trade. exactly their system. We just don't have that up operational yet because they have to have a certain amount of gold in our box in order for other people to come and do that. But that is their system. You can go to one of their vaults around the world and either take out or put in where it, depending on what you have, what, what, what's, what, what, uh, what corresponds to you. So yeah, you can, you can buy, you can buy a a thousand dollars worth of Kinesis money and you can go to any Kinesis vault and say, I want a thousand dollars worth of gold physically. And they have to, they give it to you. Oh, they have a minimum amount to do that. I want to be accurate. I'm just using an example, but it, within their minimum amount, whatever that is, you have to you have to qualify. Yeah, we had some people uh, on Twitter ask about: uh, Is there a minimum investment to work with you guys? And uh, I, w- I wasn't even going to get around to the question because I figured all you got to do is pay six hundred bucks or whatever to for the vault. The yes, that's but, it. I mean, that's it. You just yeah. buy the buy the box, yeah. and then you you put in whatever you want. If you want to buy gold, there's no, uh, you know, if you want to buy a small amount, we can sell you a small amount. If you want to buy larger amounts, and we have to order it, and that's ordered through uh, our Peruvian broker company, and mm-hmm. that takes a few days, but that's how it's done. Got it. And then how does the gold actually make its way into your box, right? Because do they need access to your box or how did, so how does it get in and out I mean, of the fit, box? When, let's say you bought it, you want to buy yeah. new gold. You just bought, opened up a box. You, you make a purchase order and we have it delivered to us through either mm-hmm. Brinks or another one of the uh, uh, dealers that are transporters. And, yep. um, and sometimes believe it or not, in, in the case of silver and gold, uh, we've bought some from U S producers and they've actually special mailed it with insurance, of course. And, uh, mm-hmm. we've taken, we've taken possession of that. Once we take possession mm-hmm. of it, uh, for, for the client, we contact the client and the client has to come and physically take possession and put it in to their chosen box. Oh, really? They can't just, the client can't just be like, Hey, Alex and team, can you put, I, I give you permission to put this gold in my box. No, we would, you can give us permission to hold it in our box until you're ready. And, and I have done that for some clients, but, uh, we can't access your box. Yeah, it makes sense. I guess that's the value of maybe having a Panama-based power yeah. of attorney. I mean, we we don't pop by and, and and even if you wanted to, I don't want that power. You, you, we can't access your box. We can access our own box and hold it for you until you're ready to come and take care of it. But when it, you can't just say, Alex, take the take my gold and put it in my box. We don't have the key to it. In order for us to get in, we have to have two keys: our key and your key, and we will not take possession of that. We don't want that responsibility. And we would never recommend that anybody allow that to happen. Definitely makes sense. Yeah, this this Kinesis thing is very interesting. I feel like I just, I'm not a crypto guy, so I can't ask the, the, the most nuanced questions about it, but hopefully I've done somewhat of a decent job in the past. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of all crypto. I do like the blockchain, and that's why I'm doing this, because the blockchain is the most secure way of exchanging value, and the fact that gold and silver is backed 100% one-to-one on this exchange is what's interesting to me. I don't care about everything else. I don't I don't care about uh, trading. I don't care about all that. I just want to know if I've got a coin, a, a crypto coin that's that says one dollar or one piece of gold, it's worth one piece of gold. 
and it's physical Mm -hmm. and it's physically there. That's what I care about. And that's what we offer. We're not trying to get into uh, anything else that's creative. We don't do any of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll have to get these guys on the podcast and expand uh, further on it. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple uh, random questions, change it up a little bit. Um, what about fine art? Can people store fine art Absolutely. with you guys? Do you have bo- like how does that work? Do you have boxes that size? What about the the climate control? Well, it's all, it's very cold in our it, it's the climate is about sixty five, uh, maybe a little colder. So yeah, it's uh, you can store art. Uh, we have a couple of special areas that we can we have there, and we can adapt to larger areas if people have. Uh, some very special art that they want to store. We can, we can, we can modify. Okay. Yeah. Cause a painting's like kind of a, a specific physical profile, right? It's not that you don't see that too much in Panama, but yeah, we do have the ability to do it. Yeah. I guess if it hits the out- outdoor airs for even a second, paintings, painting. No, <laughs> no, but I mean, it does have a, there's a lot of humidity in Panama, but we're, we're yeah. a very, uh, we're a very climate controlled place. Yeah, yeah, I'm just kind of messing around. Um, what is, I guess you don't know, but like, what is some of the weirdest stuff you've heard about people holding in the vault? Really, we don't have, <laughs> we don't have a lot because I, I'm, I, I try and uh, keep, keep. Uh, we we edit our people. We make sure that we don't let people come in that are going to do strange things. Uh, most people. They either keep their precious metals, or they. A lot of people keep their their legal documents and their uh, their valuable mm-hmm. papers. You know that's how they save it. They they want to make sure it's safe. They want to make sure nobody's gonna nobody's going to rob you there. They may rob you when you're on the street, but they're not going to rob you there. No, it makes sense. Uh, we you must have like one or two good stories about. Uh... I don't know, people wanting to store weird stuff or, no, or something like not that. Really. <laughs> they, not, <laughs> not really. Not uh, really. I mean, it's it's pretty cut and dry when it comes to that. All right. Fair enough. Um, what's your like go-to spot in Panama for living? Um, is it Panama City? Do you, do you have a affinity for Boquete or, or other areas like that? Or uh, down in Coronado? It depends maybe? on the lifestyle. I mean, I like to be um, – I like to be around uh, the bay in Panama in the city. Um, mm-hmm. When I like to go to a restaurant, I like to be able to go out and eat where I want to go. And Panama City has a lot of great choices. Uh, places like Boquete are are very slow. If you like that calm life and uh, you want to you want to escape, that's your place. There's also Boca del Toro which is uh, kind of a strange mixture. It feels like you're in, you're in the Caribbean island in, instead of Panama, a little bit of Jamaica. Mm-hmm. You know, it has a different flavor and there are a lot of American expats there. Beautiful water. If you like fishing, God, I can't think of a better place, but uh, for uh, a city life, uh, the, the electricity of a great city, the city of Panama and places like, uh, Balboa Avenida Balboa, which is the where all the uh, the the Hilton Hotel and all those uh, uh, some beautiful places there, and you got the the old mm-hmm. Trump Hotel and Casino there, and very it's it, there's a lot to do in Panama. Yeah, yeah, I love Panama. Um, I want to try to weave in a question about boating and yachting and stuff because I know you got the Atlas Vault's office is actually quite close to at least one of the marinas in Panama. I'm not sure how to weave a question together. Well, if you want, we, you know, we've um, actually had customers that come in from different parts of the world, and they we will, you know, we have people that are that are boat captains and will handle taking you out for a fishing trip. Uh, we'll put you in touch with them. You know, we, we've had it happen. So it, it does happen a lot because people come in and from California, from Texas and hey, can, can you get me a good, uh, boat captain? It'll show me the good fishing areas. And we're, we're more than happy to put you together. Mm -hmm. One question I had was obviously up until about a year ago, um, 
year ago, two years ago, it was very easy to get residency in Panama under the Friendly Nations visa. They've since made it much harder where the typical on-ramp now is you might have to make an, inv an investment of $200,000 or something. Maybe you could get in under the pensionado visa without the investment. Because I think there might be some clients that might feel uncomfortable storing wealth in Panama if their only way to get at it is through a tourist visa because then you know you're kind of putting a lot of risk on you know being able to enter the country and the border official or whatever how how would you respond to that sort of question like in terms of maybe getting them a residency permit or or maybe they actually don't need it you, you, you understand don't, what you I'm don't need at? a permit to do any of the stuff that like to get a box or have an account you don't need a residency i i didn't have a residency uh, for years. I mean, I just recently got a residency because I, I really didn't care to do it. Uh, now I'm glad mm -hmm. I did it. And I did it because of the fact that when 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 the Panama restrictions, uh, when there were restrictions on travel because of the pandemic, everything became harder. Uh, but I still traveled. I just had to go through a little bit, you know, a little more of a, of a hassle. Now, I mean, you, anytime you invest any kind of in any business, or if you have an account, a bank account of any uh, within the minimum amount, you're going to qualify. Uh, yes, it's it's what they've done is they made sure that a lot of the the poor countries and poor people don't get their immediate visas. But if you're coming in as a as a traveler and you're coming in to get a visa uh, with you don't it doesn't I mean two hundred thousand if you buy an apartment or you open up a business. You're going to be able to get that visa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you meet the qualifications. Like yeah, it's not that hard to get. As a matter of fact, it's a lot cheaper than most other countries. Most of the countries in Europe uh, require a great deal of, of, of money. And I think there's one island I can't remember at the top of my head that's even that's a lot cheaper. But most like the Cayman Islands that that's gotten pretty expensive. It's true, yeah. I think to get into Bahamas or Cayman, it might be like a oh, yeah. million bucks or. Yeah. And and you know the funny thing is that I'm not sure why, you know why what's the big deal because they're, it's not like you get any special protections or anything like that. You're, you're basically out in the open with those with in in those countries, so you're not getting anything extra. You know, Alex, I feel like if I uh, if I came down to Panama and we busted out the cigars and the scotch, you'd, you'd have tons of good stories. <laughs> um, I know we're short on time, but um, yeah, I mean, I almost want to get like one or two stories out of you. What what were the two um, uh, the two bank failures that you mentioned that you witnessed firsthand? Well, I was in in Greece. Uh, it wasn't a bank failure, but I can tell you that I had business. I had business, and I still have business in Greece. And they closed, they, they restricted all people's bank accounts and they took what is called a haircut. So that means that whatever, whatever money I went to bed with in my account, I woke up with 40% less. That was a haircut. Yeah, I remember and that. That was, remember that was that. having a business on Cyprus and having a business in, in Greece. And that was... That was an experiment that went on and uh, by the uh, the banking industry, and I think it was a successful one because there weren't there weren't any revolutions in the street. People just took it. And with regard to with regard to Panama, uh, I personally had an account in the bank that was closed down by uh, by the U.S. government, and that bank once it was closed everything that was in it pretty much went bankrupt. So uh, whatever, whatever person had, if you had a savings account, you pretty, you lost it all. If you had investments in the bank, you lost even more than that. And if you had safety deposit boxes in that bank, you lost what you had. Because if you have a safety deposit box in a bank, you belong to the bank. The bank owns it. Mm -hmm. And most people don't have that understanding. That's why it's important to have everything out of the system, out of the banking system. And you are your only control in, in a private 
safety deposit box and vault. You are the one. And in a bank, the bank has so many different things that it's involved in. It's got it's got all of these different investments that it does. That is something that you need to stay away from when you're trying to protect your wealth. And yeah, I and in this this bank, uh, it's called Balboa Bank, went down down the drain, and uh, everybody that had money in it pretty much got screwed. Yeah, crazy. Um, do you want to just tell us one more time, what are the benefits of storing wealth outside of the banking system and why is there an increasing need for privacy in the world today? Privacy is the biggest benefit. The second biggest benefit is, and I think it's probably as important, is that you are the only one who controls your wealth, your savings. No one else can come in. No one else can grab it. No one else can touch it. It's yours. You come in and you go out on your own at at that vault, and that belongs to you. Why is that important? Because... If you care about your privacy, you know, we're getting to the point now where in the United States, if you spend more than $600, they want to know about it. At some point, there's something called ESG. ESG is where they will determine whether or not you're one of the good guys. If you're spending money on things that they don't like, or you're eating too much beef, or you're, you know, they don't, they have determined at certain points, it keeps changing, that you're in a group of people that are not doing the things that the superiors have determined you should do. With digital currency, which is coming, digital currency, they'll be able to control everything you spend your money on. They'll be able to control who you support financially. They'll be able to control if you give truckers who protest the government your money. Do you want that? I think it's it's a problem. And, uh, and if you keep going down that road of allowing government to, to, to decide everything you have and everything you spend, which is coming, you are, you're going to lose a great freedom. And that's what this is about. It's so important to have control over your money and how you spend it and where you put it. That is what this is about. And if you allow, you go down the path of the government's creating digital currency and creating rules and regulations as to what you can spend it on, you are going to become a slave to the system. I don't think that we can always avoid it, but we can we can minimize what happens with it. And that's the reason that's the reason why you should have something saved up in a, in a totally private environment. Not to create, not to not to violate law, not to, not to break any law, but to do what you have a right to do, which is save your earned money in your own private way. That's what it's all about. Well said, Alex. Uh, this has definitely been a very thought-provoking episode and hopefully a very educational episode for people as well, because it's not very often we can get the CEO of a vault and gold storage company uh, to, to give a a full length interview. So, uh, we really appreciate your time and I'm sure everyone learned a lot. Um, so Alex, uh, this is the time in the episode where you can, uh, tell people where they can find you and, uh, get whatever message across that you would like to share with. Well, you can find us on, uh, at atlasvaults.com and you can, you can visit us and we, we highly recommend and we invite all of you if you're in Panama, come and visit us, inspect, do everything you want. And we're, we're there. We're, we'll answer questions. And we, uh, you know, we, we like to keep things open and we like to be, we like verifiable uh, behavior and activity. So come and visit us. And uh, I invite you to come and come in when you're, if you're down around the area, stop by and see me. I will be. I will be uh, planning on, on coming to Panama uh, just in a couple months, so we'll definitely talk about Fantastic. Thank you for the invitation. Awesome. Well, this has been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. 
Again, our guest today was Alex Kapitanakis, the CEO of Atlas Vaults. Thanks everyone for listening.